tank journey, we actually were able to make this technological breakthrough after five years. We got two cordless mics, and it happens to, to interact with a panel or something. So, um, Journey bought them and gave them to Collected Works, so that's a happy event. And um, this bookstore is another happy event. If you have some money in your pocket and there's a book you've been hankering after, please put your money here. Uh, Dorothy provides not only space for Journey, but for hundreds of other great local events, totally for free. So, you know, she really deserves our, um, our thanks and our support. Thank you, Dorothy. So without further ado, ado, not ado, I'm going to introduce, who, who's first? You guys, Thomas? Thomas Jaggers, Jeff Haas, Carmen Stone, Alan Hoffman, and I'm going to let them, um, I, I borrowed Brian's sweet pan watch, so I'm going to have, um, is 10 minutes a piece okay? Possible well, minutes? Well, let's be flexible. We'll be flexible. I may give you 10 and 10 minutes, 30 seconds. Yeah, we'll be flexible. I, I'm i assuming that you guys would like to have interaction with these guys after the talks, right? Yeah. So we're going to keep it to 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up. Okay, who's first? You guys sit down. Yeah. Sit down. you got cordless mics and chairs. Do you want to introduce them? Alan Hoffman. Carmen Stone, Thomas Jaggers, Jeff Haas. And a big thank you to Julian Harris. Yes. Be careful with these mics. Who are you? Hi, everybody. My name is Thomas Jaggers. This is David Baker, who uh, hosts Journey every week and hosts the radio show. He's a Excellent local activist and yeah, leader. David Bacon is with KSFR radio station, and he hosts a program every Thursday night called Living on the Edge. Over 10 years, right, David? 12 years? 15 years? Long, long time. Hi, everybody. It's, it's very nice to be here. I feel like I'm talking to a pillar in the morning. <laughs> um, it's nice to see so many faces here for a, uh, an Occupy event. Um, lots of friends and lots of new faces as well. Um, Journey asked Occupy to come and talk about um, where Occupy is at the moment and what the future of Occupy is, and, and Julian Hans, who has been integral to the movement here in Santa Fe, I think asked the four of us to come and speak. Um, I guess I want to say right from the beginning that we're just one, a few of the many people who are involved in Occupy over the months and the last year here in Santa Fe. Um, so when we open it up for questions, I hope that it can be a conversation between all of us. Um, I think there, I see many people here who've been equally involved in, in the Occupy movement and I think the conversation can be a whole community conversation rather than a back and forth between an audience and a panel. In thinking about today, I, I, um, I was a little nervous. Um, Occupy as a movement arose so quickly and became so powerful and meant so much to so many people um, and so many different things to so many people that to, to have the four of us speak about our perspectives on it feels kind of limiting and even just in the few days before today there was some back and forth online as people uh, wondered why we were the speakers and what was going to be spoken about and is Occupy dead or is it still going and so I can feel there's still a lot of energy around this movement of transformation in this country um, and that's great that's great. Whatever Occupy is, whatever it becomes, the fact that so many people are interested in transforming our political and uh, culture and our political systems is fantastic because really only through doing that are we going to make any changes, the changes that we have to make in this country.
Um, when we spoke about what we were going to say, I, I was asked just to give a little bit of history about Occupy and, and Occupy Santa Fe, just to give a little bit of context. I'm sure most of you know that the Occupy movement in the United States um, came out of an ad placed in the, the Canadian magazine Adbusters, which called for action on Wall Street. Um, a few months later, on September 17th of last year, um, just a very few people went down and tried to get into Wall Street, couldn't get into Wall Street, and so um, ended up occupying the public space in Zuccotti Park, very close to Wall Street. Um, that in itself was, of course, inspired by the Indignado movement in Spain and the, the many um, protests and uprisings uh, which were called the Arab Spring, um, which themselves have been in the works and been planned for years before um, last year. Um, in Santa Fe, so out of what happened in New York in Zuccotti Park, people all around the country started to take their inspiration from that and occupy public spaces, start holding public meetings. And in Santa Fe, we gathered for the first time on October 1st, two weeks later, outside Bank of America on Paseo de Peralta in St. Francis. There were about 60 people there that morning, I would guess. Um, two weeks later, on October 15th, which was a, an announced global day of action, closer to a thousand people gathered outside the Roundhouse um, for a rally for teachings, um, for a march from Bank of America to the Roundhouse. And in that, Escalation from 60 odd people on a street corner two weeks before to nearly a thousand people outside Roundhouse, we could see how much energy there was for change just here in Santa Fe, which, as I'm sure you're all aware, is not the most politically active of towns in the United States. <laughs> Numerous other actions and events followed over the next months um, in no particular order on, on January the 17th, which was the opening day of the New Mexico legislature. Um, close to a thousand people again gathered outside the roundhouse. We encircled the roundhouse as a, show, as a symbolic statement of this is our political process. This is our home of democracy here in New Mexico. Um, there was an a innovative, inspirational protest against ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, just down the road outside the El Dorado hos uh, Hotel. Hospital, I almost said. Um, protests against Walmart, protests against big banks. Um, the protest against big banks across the nation resulted in about $7 billion being transferred out of big banks into local banks and into local credit unions. That was one of the most fantastic um, national pieces of action which took place last year, I think. Um, an Occupy working group came up around Los Alamos National Laboratory, as Jeff was referencing earlier. That, that resulted in um, big conference, rally, and action uh, up in Los Alamos in the summer. Um, which was a good statement. We have to keep going on the nuclear issues. This is something that's in our backyard. It's something we cannot ignore. Um, and that's going to be ongoing. And of course, we had the encampment. Um, started very briefly uh, on Paseo de Parata, opposite Bank of America, and then fairly quickly moved into the rail park. And was there for about three months in the end. Um, sometimes sparsely populated, sometimes heavily populated, but there constantly for about three months. But, out of all of these things, for me at least, the most important aspect of what Occupy brought was gatherings like this. We had general assemblies, at first nightly, and then three times a week, um, mostly in the rail park, for more than three months, where people came, and for the, really the first time, considering that we live in a society where so many of us feel almost completely politically disenfranchised and disengaged because the system as it is does not allow us to participate beyond voting once every few years. At times, the tent in the rail park would have 80 to 100 people in participating in the General Assembly, um, participating in grassroots democracy with a community of local peers. The, the process that came out of that, the, the beginning, the establishment of an understanding for all of us and a capacity for all of us to participate in democracy, 
for me was the one of the most amazing things about the Occupy movement. Half the people in this room who I know I did not know one year ago. It all came about through those general assemblies, through the working groups. In New York, general assemblies would have hundreds of people every single night in Zuccotti Park. Hundreds of people participating because they wanted to participate, because they knew how important it was that they finally find a political voice for themselves. I, of course, was not around during the civil rights era um, or the Vietnam protests, but I spoke to many, many people last fall who said to me that they had been and that they had then disengaged from the political process for 40 years and Occupy was the first time they had felt called to re-engage. I think that speaks to the power of it. I think the fact that a year later, with very little having happened over the last few months, we've got probably 50 people in this room today, there's still so much desire for there to be a grassroots democratic political movement in this country. And this, of course, was happening not just in Santa Fe and New York, but all over the country. In over a thousand different cities and towns, people were gathering every night for general assemblies. People were getting together, organizing working groups in order to organize actions, in order to educate each other. All done in our own time, completely voluntarily, with very little financial support. Here in Santa Fe, the work of Occupy went beyond just organizing actions. It went beyond the general assemblies that um, resulted in these local political conversations. We also started moving into education. Um, there were teachings and workshops on numerous of the different issues, including climate change, including the nuclear issue. Um, and we also started to delve deeper, especially with the help of unoccupied Albuquerque. We were looking into issues of racism and colonization. We did a number of workshops and uh, gatherings around sexism, classism, and also workshops looking at the deeper mechanics of the economic system, which so impacts all of us. So there was an educational component to it which, as well, which I think was, was incredibly important. <coughs> and yet, despite all of this, despite my enthusiasm, despite our enthusiasm, despite the fact that people are still here in this room, the Occupy movement has dwindled away. The potential that was there, apparent on the streets, in many cities throughout this country last year, has dwindled to the point where there are no more general assemblies. At least I don't know of any general assemblies that are still happening in the United States. I think there are there was a lot of success. We changed the political landscape, we changed the political language, but nonetheless, in my opinion, the potential that lived in Occupy has not fully been realized, at least not yet. Um, and for me, I'm not so interested in arguing the toss back and forth about whether it has realized its potential or whether it hasn't, but I'm interested in learning why it hasn't lived up to all that it could have done. What is it that we can take from this movement over the last year? What is it that we can take from from how we came together and from how we struggled together and learn from that so that as we go forward, because we have to go forward, the movements that we engage with and stay involved with become more powerful and become even greater, stronger catalysts for change. It's, I think it's clear to all of us who are engaged to, um, in the camps that the government the police and the media especially did a really excellent job in their terms in suppressing the Occupy movement. They were very, very smart about it. We know now that the, the action to close down the camps, which usually happened in the very early hours of the morning, was coordinated on a national basis. The White House called together the cities and the mayors of the United States where Occupy encampments were happening. And they together planned how, when, and where they were going to close down the camps. This was not individual cities acting alone. This was a national action. The media did an excellent job in... Wrap it up, it says. Okay. The media did an excellent job in um, minimizing the Occupy movement. But what I wanted to say, what I, what I want to quickly finish off with, if I may, is that 
the job that they did in closing down the encampments, I think, was only so successful because we internally faced such challenges. We come from such, we are all coming out of such a dysfunctional culture and such a dysfunctional society where we really don't know how to be in community with each other. We don't know how to practice democracy. We have no connection with the land. We have no connection with our food. We have no feeling for a global citizenship so that we can go and, if we don't have what we need here in this country, then we go and perpetuate wars in other countries in order to get what, what we want. So we're all carrying, as individuals and collectively, so much dysfunctionality, so much baggage, and that came out in the Occupy movement. So general assemblies after a honeymoon period fairly quickly broke down into antagonism, into personal attacks, into arguing back and forth. And we really have to, to take that experience and to take what we learned from that and to take our consciousness and our understanding about the dysfunctionality that we're struggling with into the future movements, into the future actions that we do. My hope is that Occupy... Um, I, I don't know whether the Occupy movement is going to continue as Occupy or not, but my hope is that in this very long struggle for transformation that we face and that we have to undertake if we're going to continue any kind of functioning human society on this planet, that Occupy acts as a spark, that we've woken up again politically after 40 years, and that that spark and that learning can then go forward and go into whatever new movements it is, and that we can look back on Occupy as, as the beginning of something quite tremendous. Hi everyone, my name is Carmen, and um, I'm going to pick up where Thomas left off, I think. Um, and I want to look, I want to answer the question, why? Why did they strategically take down the camp? The answer is because it was working. And they knew it was working. The camps were self-sufficient. They were operating. They were operating in a cooperative effort with their communities. Doctors, professors came to the camps and gave freely of their time. Kitchens were set up. Waste management was handled. The camps were a living, breathing example of a collective community in which all contribute, all are valued, and all are taken care of. The camps exemplified the theories and strategies of anarchism, which are at the very roots of the Occupy movement. And Sheridan can really teach you about anarchism. Um, they operated in a non-hierarchical, horizontal consensus, and participatory democracy was practiced. Despite all the problems that, that uh, Thomas did point out, this is what was being attempted. Out of those living, breathing communities came the outcries of society that in a few short months changed the conversation of a nation. The, the message was simple. We are the 99%. So where are the occupiers now? That's the question. I say they're everywhere. Activists have splintered off into affinity groups where smaller groups of people concentrate and work on a single issue. A lot of powerful work is coming out of that. Uh, they took what they learned in the camps and they went back into the neighborhoods and worked with their neighbors, the people who had been hit the hardest by austerity and corporatism. I want to show you some of those. I'm going to uh, zero in on a few of those actions now. One of the most successful uh, group works being done is on the foreclosure issue. Occupy groups throughout the country have united with families who are losing their homes, and they've united with other foreclosure coalitions. Um, they're exposing the corrupt bank uh, practices, and they're either forcing the banks to give the family modifications, or they're buying more time for the uh, families to find another place to live, sometimes the evictions, they have two weeks to get out. These are families who have been in their home for 20, 25 years, and they're expected to leave in two weeks. Or they're going into court and challenging the legitimacy of the actual title, because as we know, most of the banks can't produce that right now. This has been done in a lot of ways, and there's a really good example right now in Los Angeles, Fort Hernandez. Um, they've barricaded the property in, and they've built a wall. And occupiers and other activists are there. They're camping in the yard. They got sofas on the sidewalks. 
They're going public. The family has detailed the, um, the, the, the details of their case against Bank of America. The police come on a regular basis. They did bulldoze, bulldoze the wall down, but the wall's back up. Um, also, uh, let's see, Occupy Denver. Occupy Denver joined forces with a foreclosure coalition to block an eviction. This was an elderly couple. On October 30th, a SWAT team, like with those AK-47 things, moved in and, uh, on the home and they, they threw activists and media to the ground. They arrested them. And the pictures of that, to me, that's what a police state looks like. And this is America. We're not talking about a foreign country. This is right here in America. Another group, I'm, I'm moving quickly because I want to try to get this in, but another uh, focus group that has happened has come up around jail solidarity and our political prisoners, and we have political prisoners. Um, what is the response of the state when they see a movement growing? Arrest their activists. Through entrapment, false charges, taking advantage of the vague terrorist implications, they wrongfully detain them, they beat them, they set the bail too high, and threaten them with the possibility of extremely long jail sentences. This is one of the strategies they use to shut down a movement. Um, I have the privilege of working very closely with uh, a good friend and a powerful activist who is doing strong jail support in um, Chicago right now, but is working with activists and legal representation uh, uh, throughout the country. And I just want to give you a brief rundown on some of it. Gulfport 7 in Houston. Um, a secret undercover agent with the police department infiltrated Occupy Austin. He created the action. He brought up the idea for the action they were going to do and that they were going to use lockboxes. He knew fully well that the materials for the lockboxes were illegal. He supplied them and set up the whole action. They are now fel uh, facing felony charges. NATO 5. During the NATO sum summit in Chicago this summer, amongst the hundreds of arrests of anti-war and occupied protesters made by the Chicago Police Department, five activists were entrapped again by FBI infiltrators arrested and falsely charged with acts of terrorism. In Seattle, three young anarchists were subpoenaed to a federal grand jury for their political beliefs. They're thrown in jail for up to 18 months for exercising their Fifth Amendment rights by refusing to answer any questions regarding crimes they had no connection to. The Tar Sands Blockade, it's a beautiful action in Texas. Uh, they're trying to stop the expansion of the Canadian Tar Sands and Keystone XL pipeline. Activists from all kinds of organizations are there, and they are under the threat. They're being charged as eco-terrorists. I don't know how much you all know about this uh, project, but the devastation to the land, to the planet, to the climate, I ask you, who are the terrorists? On December 8th, we're putting on a fundraiser. I put out some information, because I can't even remember where it is. Fill space. Um, and the time and all of that, I'm gonna, I want to try to rush through to get everything, but we're going to have music and poetry and painting and artists and... Um, we're going to raise, we want to raise money for legal funds to be used for the political prisoners. Um, also, I have a personal friend who should be getting out of jail soon, an another person falsely charged. He informed us that in Cooks County in Chicago, they no longer give them toothpaste. So for anybody who has no money in their commissary, they can't even meet a basic health need of brushing their teeth properly. So we want to use the money for that type of thing. We want to put money in their commissary. And I'm, I have information. I have their contact information. They love receiving letters. They love receiving, receiving books. They're reading. You know, and if anybody can and is there, they love being visited. Another really great example of the power of affinity groups is Strike Day. Strike debt emerged from a series of open assemblies between Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Theory. Debt is a global system of domination and exploitation of the 99% by the 1%. Strike debt con connects a diverse group of individuals and communities in an effort to resist the debt system. 
One of their initiatives is the writing of uh, and publishing of the Debt Resistors Operations Manual. It's a, available for a free download, and I've made that all of that information available too. Strike Debt is also hosting teach-ins and assemblies, lending support to the Occupy Student Debt Campaign Pledge of Student Debt Refusal. There are also plans for direct actions across the country. Strike Debt is also launching the Rolling Jubilee. The Rolling Jubilee is a bailout of the people by the people. Banks sell debt for pennies on the dollar. Then usually, you know those uh, bothersome collector people who call your house, they, they, then they collect the debt at a cheaper interest rate. Well, they call my house anyway. <laughs> the, ro the Rolling Jubilee will buy the debt through donors, which is us, and abolish it. When an individual abolishes debt, it's considered a gift, and it's not taxable. The launch will begin on November 15th with a telethon called the People's Bailout. The goal is to raise at least $50,000, which would allow for the abolishment of more than a million dollars worth of debt. It won't be individual debt. It's going to be a, when they figure out whose debt it is, they will be contacted, but they're targeting uh, medical debt and student debt and credit card debt. The telethon will be held in New York City, and it will be streamed live at www.rollingjubilee.org, where donations can be made now. And again, all of this information I, I put on the chairs and I hand it out. <coughs> Occupy inspired the birth of new activists. Oh, one more, one more little plug. Ethan and I are going to be interviewing some of the people that I told you about who are working hard on the political prisoner issue. Ethan will be doing the interviews, I'm going to record it, and then somebody with some kind of technical ability is going to help me figure out how to put it out there. So we'll keep you posted on that. So Occupy, Occupy inspired the birth of new activists who knew something was wrong but had no outlet. I fall into that category. It woke some people up for the very first time. Occupy re-inspired people to organize, protest, and strike. Look at the organizations that came together to fight for their collective bargaining rights in Wisconsin. Occupy reminded us of the power of the people when they come together. Walmart employees are striking. People have set up the Bainport 10 city in Illinois fighting for their jobs. More people are discussing climate change, NDAA, drone warfare, community gardens, and Monsanto. In fact, I'm in the social work program at New Mexico Highlands University, and in my social policy class, we've taken on a project. We want to write the equivalent of Prop 37 for here in New Mexico. So we've reached out to some um, organizations that have already been uh, working in this area, in particular, Tewa Women United, who are really, really excited. They're reaching out to their alliances, and we're going to be setting up a meeting soon. I will let you all know, because this is going to need a lot of support and a diversity of uh, tactics. So is Occupy dead? Are communities, or organizations, and unions forming alliances? Yes. Are more people aware and outraged that corporations own governments? Yes. Are more people taking to the streets in opposition to of austerity, brutal police tactics, and labor rights, just to name a few issues? Yes. Does it matter what we call it? Not to me. If it's a 350.org uh, action, Occupy Homes, or a teacher strike, count me in. We must continue to come together to push against the system. We must push from the inside. We must push from the outside. Movements take at least 10 years to come to fruition. They shift and fluctuate. They drive and thrust. And as Francis Fox Piven says, no movement has been successful without engaging our poor people. So we must go into our neighborhoods, stand beside them, and fight. This movement, whatever we choose to call it, is brand new. And make no mistake, there is a movement. Look at the response of the state in our country and countries throughout the planet for your proof. This movement is alive, it is breathing, and it is growing. Its very heart is pulsating in me, in you, in our brothers and sisters all over this planet. We are awake. We must not go back to sleep. 
we must awake those who still slumber. Thank you in all power to the people. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think Thomas and Carmen are statements about what the Occupy movement has done. Excuse me, is this, this better? Okay. I think both Thomas and Carmen, as young people, are statements about the impact of <laughs> Occupy. And I think that uh, they're under, both in terms of their understanding and also in terms of, uh, in terms of Carmen's activism, they're examples of what uh, Occupy has done. Tell us who you are. Oh, okay. I'm Jeffrey Haas, uh, and I'm, an old, I'm a, a, a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer, a founder of the People's Law Office in Chicago. And I've been active here around another, another Jewish voice and uh, no, no attack on Iran. And anyway, I'm an, I'm an old... I, I guess I'm an old lefty, not one who has sat, uh, sat around waiting for Occupy to come. But I can say that the excitement that we saw in the 60s, the challenge to the patriarchal, racist, imperialist society that the 60s movement brought. Uh, I didn't see, hadn't really seen that broad excitement again until we saw Occupy, this time raising the issue of our plutocracy or inequality of income. And I saw a mass movement uh, around those issues that raised the consciousness everywhere, even, uh, of course, in the electoral campaign where uh, Obama hesitantly but finally accepted the idea that income inequality was an issue that was worth raising. So it's had a, it's had a huge impact. It was very different, it was quite different in some ways from the 60s, which was very much ideological uh, divisions and sectarian, and we debated all kinds of issues and came together. I think one of the strengths and to some extent a possible weakness of the Occupy movement it didn't have ideological unity in that sense. On the one hand, it brought broad groups of people together who had not been politically active uh, and who benefited from the different experiences and outlooks of each other. And sometimes also it made it difficult to move forward with that difference. And I think that that's something we should recognize. And as Thomas said, we're not in a society where people are necessarily open to listening to each other and figuring out how to work out things together. So those differences also ended up, I think, making a difference. Nevertheless, I think Occupy did change the political landscape. It said, this system isn't going to work. We want a different system, which was something that hadn't really been raised since the 60s or the 30s in any extent in this country. And I think the fact that people are continuing to work the way Carmen is and so many splinter groups have come about uh, are, are a tremendous uh, recognition. And just the, the language that we use, uh, the fact that more and more people are aware that we live in a country where a very few people control the wealth and the power in this country uh, has been really brought home. I just think one of the uh, sort of organizational issues that we had in uh, Occupy here uh, was brought out in a demonstration we did against ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, <clears throat> I think we recognize that ALEC was the epitome of how big business controls the legislatures of this country. They propose bills that get passed in each country. For example, each state. in each state. For example, the, the prison, the private prison industry created the anti-immigration laws to fill up private prisons. And they were passed in many, many states in this country. And also many members of the New Mexico legislature were parts of that. So we, as, as Occupy, planned to expose them. And we did a demonstration at their dinner at the El Dorado. And we had a lot of people, and we had a puppet, and we had some wonderful fake menus uh, <laughs> that got tossed around, as people heard. <laughs> and I think we, and yet, the press ignored us. The only thing the press picked up on was the action by some of the direct action people in Occupy. And here we had a situation where people 
creatively took on and hung a banner from the top of the El Dorado, talking about who Alec was. And it was very dramatic. Again, we had a great demonstration. The newspapers didn't pick it up. But when people went in and confronted Alec on who they were, that's what made the newspapers. It took an action to do that. Maybe not the best planned action, but nevertheless, we confronted them in a way that made the press look at it. Unfortunately, because they picked up on who threw what and who got hit in the eye and who threw a punch, not on what Alec is. So, <clears throat> on the other hand, I think when we look back, we were the group that began the fall of Alec, because as most of us know, six months later, it was exposed that they were behind the laws, that you don't have the right to retreat and things like that, and a lot of corporations didn't want to be connected with that, and it's, they, they've withdrawn support. But I think arguments over what kind of tactics, to what extent can people be independent and yet responsible, are issues that every movement's going to have to work out. And I just think that these are things that we have to look forward to in other movements and, and, and as the movement reemerges and grows again. I don't think, <clears throat> I think that as, a, as an entity, uh, Occupy exists, to, certainly not to the extent it did. But in terms of its influence, I know that there was a group, for example, that called themselves Occupy Sandy. And there were many of the New York people who had been part of Occupy. And in this situation, they went and helped the people. And in many cases, if you saw the footage, they were there way ahead of FEMA and the Red Cross. Yeah. In San Francisco, there's a group working in the Tenderloin District. But instead of being an encampment that draws people who are the, uh, who are the most... Uh, 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 least served in our society, they're starting with the problems of the society there in building institutions to try to deal with homelessness, with alcoholism. We found here, and I think everywhere around the city, when we started in Camelot, there were a lot of people and a lot of activists. When the weather got cold, the activists and people who had houses to go to went inside. And more and more, the encampments became the dispossessed of our society. I don't think we anticipated that. I don't think we had the resources to deal with that. And so if we're going to do something like that again, I think we have to anticipate how we go about dealing with, dealing with those issues. We are not a social service organization, but we have to deal with those issues. And I think beginning with the communities, in connecting with the communities, like, prison, like communities with people in prison, are the things that we have to do and build from those <coughs> movements up. So anyway, I think it was a, a, it's been a fantastic re-emergence of a, of a psychology and an energy and an understanding that we have to shake and change the basic foundation of this country and this government. My name is Alan Hoffman. Can you all hear me okay, or should I use the mic? Use the mic. Use the mic. Okay. Hi. My name is Alan Hoffman. Uh, I've been living here in Santa Fe for 37 years and have been working in the area of uh, energy self-sufficient homes, solar homes, and still build what are now called zero-energy homes. How does that lead me to Occupy? Well, I think that there has been a, a tremendous dependence on the um, energy base of the country, electricity, gasoline, coal, and I wanted to uh, show people that there is a financially viable alternative, but I couldn't. So when the Occupy movement came around, I thought maybe this is a place where this concept could have a voice. And so I traveled to Zuccotti Park in New York and spent some time there and found that the <coughs> Occupy movement was really much more about alternatives to the existing systems than it was about a political movement. So my position is Occupy is not a political movement, but it's a humanist movement. It was the, the, the thing that brought it to life was the inequity, the fact that for the last 15 years there's been redistribution of the wealth of the United States, unlike the, 
the uh, uh, right-wing proposition that we're going to redistribute the wealth. In fact, the wealth has been taken from working Americans, taken out of their pension plan, out of their salaries, out of their health care, and given to the richest 1% of Americans. Thus came the idea of the 1%. Now, to show you the diversity within the Occupy movement, I am a dyed-in-the-wool dyed capitalist. I believe that capitalism is the one thing that can move systems very quickly. The problem is, is that the 1% uh, the controlled the media. So the discussions before Occupy were, we need austerity, we need to cut debt, we need to cut back on Social Security and Medicare and those kinds of things. And thanks exclusively to the Occupy movement, I believe, the discussion changed completely to the injustice of taking the wealth from millions and millions and hundreds of millions of Americans and passing it off to the one percent. And at this point, it's not money anymore. It's power. And when I saw that Citizens United gave those wealthiest one percent the ability to exert uh, power well beyond their numbers, I became very involved. And, and one quick look in, in, into history. There's a, a banner over there for something called the 99 Pledge. The first working group I got approved was Occupy Energy Policy. When I realized there was no hope of really expanding awareness of energy policy so long as rich people were allowed to invest any amount of money without limitation in campaigns and ideology and so forth, I instead uh, added another group called the 99 Pledge Working Group. And what the 99 pledge was is a pledge by politicians to, um, uh, to oppose Citizens United. This is the very first one, an enlargement of the very first one that was signed by Brian Egoff. I'm pleased to say that in last year's legislature, partially because of the awareness created by the 99 pledge, the state of New Mexico became the second state in the union to pass through the House and the Senate a memorial calling for the federal government to pass an amendment to the Constitution of the United States stating that the state of New Mexico will approve it as soon as it comes down the pike, and we should be very proud of that. Oh. Now I'm pleased to say that until Tuesday there were nine states that had passed equivalent documents, and on Tuesday the state of Colorado, where I was campaigning, passed the, uh, their own version, so it's now 10 of the 50 states have already stated that they will approve an amendment to the Constitution stating that money is not speech and corporations are not people. So that, that is a crucially important step. So now that we're working on that, I'm moving back towards, towards energy. When I was at Zuccotti Park, I had the opportunity to meet with what they called working groups. Um, I am a, a firm believer, and, and not totally in agreement with some of my other uh, occupiers, that it's not a political movement at all. It's a humanist movement that deals with specific issues. And you've heard a lot of them. The concept that I enjoyed was something called parallel institutions. You heard uh, Tomas say that we've been responsible to move almost $7 billion uh, away from big banks to local banks and credit unions. Now, $7 billion may be a drop in the bucket for trillion-dollar companies, but it's made an enormous effect on, on uh, uh, local banks and credit unions and made it possible for them to make loans to people that otherwise could not get loans. I think there's also a greater awareness on the part of, of the government that they have to do something about the foreclosure crisis, and it most certainly is a crisis. Uh, we've seen that happening. We, you heard a little bit of talk about local gardening. There's a boom in colleges where young people are learning how to get back to agriculture, urban agriculture, decentralized agri agriculture. And the concept of decentralization is something you're going to hear over and over and over. The homes that I build have a net utility bill of zero. Why is that relevant? Well, if everybody had a house like that, we wouldn't need PNM, we wouldn't need mobile, we wouldn't need any of these systems. And in fact, you'll be hearing in spring a campaign that we're doing where houses can provide their own home energy, their transportation energy, and quite a bit of food on a residential lot. That is what we can do to change things without it being political. 
So um, what we're what we're finding is that, as as was mentioned uh, by Carmen, there are many groups, offshoots of Occupy, that are dealing with social justice, that are dealing with agriculture, energy, um, uh, uh, certainly the uh, economy. Something that most people don't know is that the um, that the uh, what is it the Federal Reserve as everybody does know, is a private organization, but people don't know that it only got a 99-year charter. The charter is up in 2013. And I think it is time for us to say that we don't need to have a private organization print our money, because we owe trillions to the Federal Reserve, and if we take the Federal Reserve over, we don't owe that money to them anymore, we owe it back to ourselves. And uh, there's also something that I think grew out of Occupy. There's a group called, and I believe it's Sterling Legal. There's a uh, belief that there's $34 trillion that was stolen by banksters and some government officials and moved out of the country. 43 trillion. 43, I, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> $43 trillion was stolen and moving out, moved out of the country. That's enough to pay off the entire $16 trillion that we owe in national debt and enough to pay all those predatory loans that were foisted upon the American people. So what I'm, what I'm hoping, and, and let me just also touch for a second on the election that we just saw. More money than ever before was poured into elections. Karl Rove put half a, half a billion dollars just from his organization that we know about, and they didn't have to tell us, into uh, spreading lies uh, about progressive candidates and it did not work. Yeah. Yeah. It did not work. Well, one of the other parallel institutions that Occupy had a, a part in creating was basically turning off mainstream media. In fact, here's a fascinating bit of information. The ratings of Fox News have dropped below Jon Stewart's show. <laughs> More people are getting their news from Colbert and Stewart, and uh, MSNBC, uh, Stewart went up 17%, MSNBC went up 3%, and uh, CNN dropped by half, and Fox News dropped, the, the numbers are not actually, well, I know it was over 20%. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because before we always presumed everybody was telling us the truth. Now we're standing here saying, you know, with a little bit of research, I can find out how many trillions of dollars are we really talking about? What really is the effect of lowering taxes on the richest Americans? You know, all of these things that we've been told and we've taken for granted because media has told us that they're true. And, and I am finding that, um, that more and more and more people are to the place now where they don't believe what's coming out of media, especially the CNNs and the Fox News. And hopefully after this rubbing that they took, um, People won't be so quick to pour a half a billion dollars into a negative ad campaign, and maybe Occupy will become irrelevant. Excuse me, I, that was a very good slip. Uh, maybe Fox News will become irrelevant, because Occupy is becoming more relevant all the time. So don't, don't believe that Occupy is dead. Alan, without CNN, how are we going to know what our generals are up to? <laughs> uh, I think there are other, there's some good other uh, groups. Okay, So, uh, in, in closing, I'll just say this. Um, your actions, voting with your wallet, making decisions about how you live your life, where you live your home, the kind of light bulbs you buy, the kind of car you buy, or do you even need a car? I just moved into town so I can live with a bicycle theory anyway. <laughs> um, so, so I just want to say this. There is a great and growing group of Americans who do not take for granted. And stations like KSFR, where David has been kind enough to elucidate us all these years, I'm also happy to say that I've been asked to be a, uh, a guest host on the Journey Home, Diego Mulligan's show this Thursday, and hopefully if I don't embarrass myself too badly more thereafter. <laughs> And we can talk about these things. And I have a major project about energy that we're going to be launching in spring, so people keep your ears to the ground. Um, if you go to newvillage.com, you can hear about it. 
And all I can say is how you live your life will have an enormous influence on how future generations will live their life. Let's get ourselves and our friends to make the right choices now so that our kids have a choice. I want to just quickly add that um, Melissa was able to get hold of Carl Rove and Rush Limbaugh, and they're going to be here next week. <laughs> 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 Why is a bad joke? What we're yeah. going to have next week. I want to thank the panel again. Before we get to questions and answers, I want to thank Julian. Um, he's, he's, he's quiet, he works in the background, but he got all this together. So raise your hand again. Next week, um, and I'll mention it now and one more time. We're going to have Nima Namadamu. She's a um, uh, an astonishing woman activist from Congo, and she's been in the United States for the last three months touring with a group called World Pulse. Um, Nima will be joined by Mijan, who's part of Occupy, part of Journey. And I think it will be, I know it will be just a fantastic program. Please plan to attend that. Nima's unlike any other person I've ever met so far on this planet. Um, she really comes out of a place of complete horror and violence, and she comes with complete love. It's quite an astonishing, uh, she's, she embodies this, and she's well worth um, hanging out with. We'll have a reception afterwards that day, too, uh, for Nima at Hotel St. Francis, so that's a, an additional perk. Um, let's open it up, and I think, Thomas, you want to run this? You want to pass the cordless mic? We'll just, I think the best way to do is just start with questions in the front rows, and then we'll work back, if that's okay. Anyone in the front row have questions? Anyone in the second row have questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone? It looks like we're going to Joe. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just some observations. I haven't been a part of your group. Um, where are the young people? Where are the people um, who aren't white? Thank you. And um, you know, there's no mention of the importance of the social media. You know, people were putting down the media, not covering the important actions of your people. But the social media, you know, are really active and very important not to forget. I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, you go first. Um, yeah. You bring up a really great point, and it was present, ever present, in our uh, meetings and our general assemblies. And um, I went to NatGet this summer, the... Uh, a national gathering of Occupy movements in Philadelphia. And there were some pretty big meetings, uh, that one in particular, that really brought that out to the forefront. Which brought out what? The, where are the people of color? Here in Santa Fe, where are the young people? Because that's really not the issue in other places, but here in Santa Fe, where are the young people is an issue. But where are the people of color was an issue throughout the country. And, you know, the whole thing was the the... the, the saying was, you know, another white guy with a bullhorn. Um, and what we heard from some women of color in particular was, you're not speaking our language, and you're not coming into our neighborhoods. And that's why I see some of the affinity groups as doing really great work, because they are speaking the language, and they are going into the neighborhoods. So... Tewa women is not respected everywhere. Fair enough. Okay. I, I don't have a response for that one. But as far as media goes, um, Out of Occupy became uh, uh, live streamers. Live streamers are where you can really find out. David Cortez is a live streamer. There are some really great live streamers that um, post all over social media. It's really easy to find. DemocracyNow.org, RT. And Free Speech TV, they're, they're, those are like some commercial places where you can find out what's going on. Um, I'll, 
I'll just say that I, I actually did when I said that uh, that places like Fox were losing listenership, viewership. Uh, absolutely, social media and the use of Facebook and the use of the websites Occupy Everything is a great one. And in fact, whatever you are interested in, if you just Google Occupy Energy Policy, <laughs> Occupy Agriculture, there is a working group and combinations of working group all over the country. So yes, social media has been used effectively. It's, there's no question in my mind it had a big effect on the recent election. So, so I think that, that that's a point well, well taken and the one that we acknowledge. But for a second, let, let's talk about the members of Occupy. Let's understand there was no organization. This was an, an ad hoc group of people who shared certain values. The fundamental value was that the economic system was unfair, that it was taking money away from hundreds of millions of working people and giving it to billionaires. When you think about where it started, it started on Wall Street. That's why. But, but that's just one issue. So as far as people of color and, and so forth, it doesn't make Occupy any less valid or relevant. The fact of the matter is that people chose to come involved. I didn't choose how I would be born. I didn't choose the color I would be. But yet, I believed it was important enough, and you can ask my family, that I've put most of my life into this for the last year. And I don't think it's invalid because I'm not a person of color. If, if, because there's no organization, how do we go out and actively enroll people? Tell, yell it out. There are lots of ways. First of all, who knows about this group? Where is this group advertised? We don't. Where we're is we're it not invited? a group. Well, it is. This is Journey every Sunday oh, morning. I see. You know, where, there are lots of things that can be done. I won't go into it all now, but lots. Well, yeah. I, I think it's time to, to move on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, just, just make, I don't need a microphone. Joe, I'd like to use the mic so people can okay. hear you. Okay. Uh, real quick. I was a part-time member of Occupy, and uh, Post your mouth. Oh, I was a very um, part-time member of Occupy. One of the things that was exciting was I uh, was a Peace Corps volunteer in 1965-67, came back and walked into the middle of the, the Haight-Ashbury Flower Child Revolution. Mm -hmm. There was an excitement there that Occupy basically touched on in so far as keeping that spark alive, and it's still very much alive in, in many of our hearts, and that's question authority, yada, yada, yada. The thing I'd like to point out, however, is that apparently Oliver Stone is having a series called The Untold Story of America. It starts apparently on Sunday, tomorrow night. It's going to run for a series of evenings, and apparently it's going to be along the lines of Howard Zinn's History of the People. Don't miss that. Uh, that's all I can say. Where will it be? I said tonight. Oh, to it's tonight. On Showtime. Thank you. What's the title again, John? It's called Showtime. It's on Showtime. It's the Untold History of America. The Untold History of America. Are there any more comments or questions to the panel? So I've seen one here. <coughs> Linda, Danny, Michelle. Can we go to Michael? Thomas, Thomas, why don't we just try to move that way? We've only got about 15 minutes. Thomas, can you okay, mention Oliver Stone, and I just saw JFK last night. Uh, it's worth a look back at that. Uh, for my own story, three years ago I accepted a substitute position at Santa Fe High. And they were putting in a roof and killing mold and mildew. They harmed me. I was told by a lawyer friend from Albuquerque that the law was, um, was, was evil and that I couldn't get any kind of care or money from my, my injury, and I've spent three years with uh, realizing that all people harmed in, our, our, in the workman's comp system, and no one gets anything. And so um, they don't get health care, they don't get um, financial uh, recompensation. Uh, I was offered $3,000. Um, the lawyer told me, Robert, accept it. There's nothing else you can do. Um, and you won't get anything more than that. I've lost $200,000 worth of income since then. And so this is a humanistic issue that, that um, 
but the corporations and the, and the law industry uh, has possibly taken away our constitutional rights. So, Linda, then, did you have a question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Linda, I'm a member of Occupy. I just wanted to um, say that things don't always happen in a linear way. I was once up in Los Alamos, and there was an initiative that we tried very hard to make impact with, and we just couldn't get anywhere. And a man showed up who was an activist from Australia named Alan Ware, and he said, you know, you sometimes have to look at things in a side way, that is, a sidewinder way, or a way that things go from one context to another. And in this regard, I wanted to say that we have seen, I think, the impact of Occupy in the recent election. I do not think that we would have had the conversation that we had about economic inequality if, if Occupy had not shocked the country with that. And I think that the outcome of the election is also um, brought to the foreground because look in terms of what Diane was saying, how many minorities came out to vote? How much the yes. demographics changed? And I think part of that was enabled by the way in which Occupy got hold of the country. I just want to say one comment. I saw it on TV that the, the general thing is big money lost. Carl Rove spent $120, and 2% of the people that he supported got elected. And But somebody else on the panel said, did they lose? How much did we hear about climate change during this election, and why? And it was it the oil companies and the Koch brothers and the weary Democrats who did, were too scared to bring that up. So did they lose completely in terms of the issue, the issue that is threatening, I think, our society? So I think we should remember that uh, when we talk about did they really lose, and in fact, who controls it. One of the other big issues, I think, in Occupy was incrementalism versus dramatic change. <laughs> that we, you know, there were people who want them being about change in the way we live, in creating energy, uh, more efficiency. But what about dealing with the oil companies? And what about dealing with the coal companies? And what about dealing with those, their influence. And I think it was a political movement, and I think that we have to realize that, and those struggles have to go on. Oh. Hi, um, my name is Dennis Cormier. I um, was a very active member of Occupy Santa Fe, uh, and continue to, despite the fact that I sometimes say provocative things like, Occupy Santa Fe is dead, I, I think it's far from dead. And most people who know me um, know that that's the case. I, I'm going to only say 20 more words or less. Um, I am a social media activist, and that has been my push, uh, and I know the power of that. However, um, I spent the last few days knowing that this meeting was coming up and saying, what is the temperature of Occupy right now? What is the thrust? What is the, what is the focus? And I'm just going to say that all of you should probably look a little more closely at the internet when you can and look for the words mutual aid. Mutual aid, I think, will become the focus and, and, and the soul of Occupy during the coming months. Some of the things that Carmen mentioned, uh, the strike debt, the uh, solidarity with political prisoners, um, Occupy Sandy which um, is not being covered well in the mainstream media, but is being covered in the alternate media. There are some phenomenal things happening, and I think mutual aid is the future of Occupy. I'm uh, Jay Cotton with New Watch in Mexico. Uh, Tomas, uh, you alluded to the fact that uh, Occupy Santa Fe got involved in Los Alamos issues and held conference uh, and some actions up in Los Alamos. Uh, so my simple question is, uh, what will be the further engagement of uh, 
Occupy Santa Fe or, or some entity thereof with Los Alamos issues. Thanks, Jerry. Um, the, the fuller story is that a uh, working group of Occupy Santa Fe um, became something more than that and became the organization Nuke Free Now, which um, put on the conference and the, and the rally and the protest in the summer. Um, Nuke Free Now was a collection of individual activists and um, activist organizations, including Nuke Watch and CCNS and others. Um, as, as you know, Jed, I mean, there's a hope that Nuke Watch will continue and keep doing more work and keep on putting on the annual protests and conferences. Um, there's, we're working on that behind the scenes, basically, at the moment. Um, but, as I said before, the nuclear issue for us living here and then nationally and, in fact, globally is massive. So this is not something that we can do one year and then drop and ignore from then on. I was so happy when I walked in and saw so many people here today because I, I am of the opinion that Occupy is not dead. And so here we all are. Um, pardon? My name is Michelle, and um, I was around in the beginning days of Occupy. I had been contacted by one of the organizers prior to the first B of A protest to see if I would participate, and, um, and I did. And, and it was a really amazing time, and I was also one of the lead organizers in the Nuke Free Now event that took place Hiroshima weekend. That was really a powerful event to uh, remind all of us and people all over the country and the world about what goes on up at Los Alamos as well as the larger nuclear issues that we're dealing with. Um, and hopefully it will take place next year again with more volunteers. So if you hear a call for volunteers for Nuke Free Now and this is an uh, area that speaks to you, please answer the call because it, um, it was a great event, but it was uh, we needed more people participating. But anyways, what I wanted to talk about, thanks Melissa, um, I think what we're hearing here, and as most of us probably know, there are so many issues in this country that need attention. And whether it's the financial irregularities or the inequality <coughs> of wealth or the private prison system that's being driven by immigration issues and issues around <coughs> marijuana just to get people in jail, um, whether it's the nuclear question, whether it's the fact that we have 104 nuclear power plants that should be starting to be closed down, but they're having their licenses extended, um, whether it's the food that we're being supplied without information about what's in that food. There are so many issues, and they all come down to the 1%. All of them. Um, and so I just want to say, whether it's under Occupy, or whether it's under a foreclosure action, or a GMO action, these are all Occupy issues. These are about people in this country taking our country back. And it's really as simple as that. You know, the system has been hijacked. And as much as, um, you know, we may have seen that Karl Rove's money and other right-wing money didn't steal the presidency, their impact was widely felt. Um, Proposition 37 in California, which was to have our food labeled if there were genetically modified organisms, was defeated because of money. Totally, 100%. Two months before the election, over 60% people favored the election, and in the 30 days before, I know I'm on my soapbox, um, it was defeated. But anyways, what I really wanted to say was two things. Um, Thomas spoke about the dysfunction that went on around Occupy, and it was a big issue. And I just want to say that moving forward in any kind of political action, I think it's up to each of us to look at ourselves and look at our personal issues and try and use opportunities when we come together to learn about those issues and not let them, let the higher reason that we come together get
pushed aside. And I think that's really important as a country. Um, and the second thing I want to say is moving forward. Um, Obama was reelected. There have been a lot of comments that he needs to be led by the public. And it's up to us to stand up and tell him what we need as a country. So please get involved in whatever moves you, whatever it is. There's got to be something that everyone in this room believes firmly in that they can get involved in. Thank you. thank you. I just want to thank you for all the work you do. I'm State Senator-elect Bill O'Neill, and I have the honor of serving with Brian Egoff and Peter Worth. You have some great representatives up here. Um, I represent the North Valley in Albuquerque. I've been a state rep with Brian for two terms. And I would just urge everyone to continue the struggle. This has an impact in ways that maybe you can't see. I, I'm here because I care about the work that you do. And as a legislator, we all have our roles in this process. It's really important, to the degree that you're comfortable with it, to, to get involved, stay involved. Up at the Roundhouse, yes. we're going to be up here the day after Martin Luther King Day. We end on St. Patrick's Day, which is a big day for me, as O'Neill that I am. <laughs> but basically, um, please contact Brian. Contact me. O'Neill is the name. I know I'll be working on, on legislation around the 1%, as she said. In 2003, Bill Richardson gave the 1% of this state this huge break, and we lose $300 million a year in this state as a result. So people like myself, Brian, others will be sponsoring legislation to rectify that. So if we're a citizen's legislature. You're welcome anytime to come and follow these issues, Proposition 37, et cetera, et cetera. But thank you so much for the work you do. Mr. O'Neill, is that your name? Yes. Okay, because my class is going to need sponsors for New Mexico's version of Prop 37. <laughs> All right. Well, then, well, I, O'Neill and then Brian. Brian and I are really close. So just, you know, Egoff. Yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. He, just, okay. he knows who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your first name? And thank you for the work you do in social work and violence. Job. That's great. I have a, a recognition to make. There's been some discussion about the younger people not being involved and also about social media. My name is Michael Lani. I'd like to recognize Ethan. I'm going to ask him a question, so if you'd hand him the microphone. Because at least on two occasions that I know of, Ethan spent the full day. One was about, I think, February and March when he went on the toxic tour with us. And we were looking at all the issues with Los Alamos and our water supply. And just a few weeks ago, he spent a full day with us again, rode with me, and we uh, were going up to the San Juan Chama Project. And we were looking at the impact that climate change has upon Santa Fe's drinking water supply. He's not just there for his own benefit. He's been videoing these, and he puts it out there on the social media, and it's stuff that I can't speak to, but I want to recognize Ethan as one of the young people and part of the work that he does. Tell us if people can see the information and tell us a little bit more about the other kinds of things you video that you put out there on the social media. Thank you again, Ethan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. Um, I was living in Española. I was a student there. I was a student president when Occupy started. And I've been an activist for a long time, so I got involved in Albuquerque here. And even in Española, we had a small group for a while. Uh, because I was there and wasn't as active, I uh, created a website, OccupyNewMexico.org. I've been very active in attending events and filming and tweeting. Um, my forte is Twitter. On Twitter, it's Occupy New Mexico, Occupy with a zero. We have almost 2,000 followers. When we reach 2,000, hopefully in time for the legislature, that'll be a milestone because we'll be the, one of the top tweeters during the legislative session. Yeah. So we also have a close 100 videos on YouTube. That's also Occupy New Mexico with a zero. Um, everyone is free to create content. It's mainly been me doing it, but if you have an issue or a post you'd like to see us get up, um, you're free to get involved. There's a lot of video. Every post I do has at least a video or photos. It's always multimedia because the younger generation really needs to be uh, audiovisually connected. I'm going into teaching, and that's an important aspect of the t technology and the culture that we are trying to create. And so it just would be great to see more people doing that in the Occupy movement. 
is doing some live streaming and filming. But as much as we can get more voices, it's not my voice that I'm trying to project. It's all your voices. And I do focus a lot on people of color. We have lots of immigrant rights uh, posts and uh, other people of color voices on the website. Great. Occupy Thank you. Thanks a lot. We only have time for three more. I'm sorry. I'm going to go Michael, this gentleman, and then Sharon. <coughs> Yes, just briefly, I think there's two critical areas we could work on on keeping New Mexico clean and pristine. And that's cleaning up the labs, uh, Lanel and Sandia and Kirtland down there with a the big uh, gas spill, whatever that is that they've spilled, uh, a gazillion gallons that they're just now paying attention to. The other big thing is fracking. So we've got to protect our water in both instances, and it's something all of us can work on. And there are groups uh, meeting all the time. So, David's one of the leaders of one of the water group. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm going to um, bring up something I'm sure most of you are not aware of, but uh, you folks mentioned earlier today that the Occupy movement started from uh, trying to put a stop to corporate interests controlling government. Well, on a local scale here in Santa Fe, the railroad industry completely controls the city government and the state government. We have a local tourist train that occupies city-owned property and the uh, downtown rail yard basically doesn't use that property for anything other than just parking its trains there. Um, they also have a, a baggage cart that's painted with graffiti that is the worst art I've ever seen in my life here in Santa Fe. It's a shame on this city. And our, city, and our city government won't do a thing about it. And also we have the Rail Runner, which is operated by an out-of-state contractor, runs through this town, total disregard for the community that it runs through. No, no regard for the people that live here whatsoever. Um, they're, they're essentially terrorists. I mean, they harass local people, uh, going through, driving through neighborhoods, with their 3,600 horsepower to 7,200 horsepower locomotives. And the Susana Martinez administration does absolutely nothing about it. They've allowed corporate interests to take complete control of that railroad. And that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. That's fine. We just got to wrap it. Okay. You have two minutes. I just have a brief announcement. Uh, Occupy activists are, are, are invited to participate in a January 8th to 11th international workshop on emancipatory paradigms hosted by the Institute of Philosophy in Havana, Cuba. Right. Some of you know that I've just gotten back from 10 days there, and so just ask me, I'll tell you all about it. Uh, dialogue with Cuban thinkers and delegates from social movements around Latin America on anti-capitalist resistance movement experience, and radical possibilities for the 21st century. Before the workshop, beginning January 1st, the Institute is organizing additional activities to help you get to know Cuba, its amazing people, and its revolution. There will be talks on the Cuban political system, the Cuban revolution, anti-capitalist resistance in Latin America, and site visits around Havana and Pinar del Rio. So, um, people can talk to you afterwards. Yes, if you I want more information, I have it here, and you've got my email address. Okay. One more round. we got to wrap it. One more round for the panel, and we got to get out of here. Thanks a lot. Just want to let people know we are going to have a demonstration of a zero energy house later today. If anybody has a question, they can ask me. Anybody else have any comments here? I actually do want to make one more comment, which goes right back to the very first comment from the audience around um, people of color. I, I'm not so much of an incrementalist or an issue person. I'm a kind of total transformation person. Um, and I agree. I think that if we're going to transform our society and culture, then we have to recognize that we're a patriarchal, racist society, whether we like it or not. And that's just a simple fact of the matter. And Occupy actually really did take that on. 
Um, we took it on here in Santa Fe. It was taken on all around the country. Um, but I agree, we, we still live in a very deeply racist country, and we have to address that. Thank you.